I, I just started being able to come back into church. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> and uh, I was teasing Scott. I, he was going to be gone, and he asked me to do music and do teach Sunday school. And I said, man, I just started coming back, and you're putting me to work already. <laughs> so we're going to uh, do a praise and worship song. Uh, if you'll take your praise books, uh, number 27, in moments like these. <clears throat> Bell stand, please. In moments like these, I sing out a song. I sing out a love song to Jesus. In moments like these, I lift up my hands. I lift up my hands to the Lord. want to say thank you thank you thank you that we could come into your house this morning with a grateful heart knowing that we've gathered together in your name and Lord even though we may be few today Lord we just know that your presence is here we know that you're right there with us every step we take and Lord let today be a day that we're pleasing in every manner to you that our worship service and everything that we do be pleasing to your sight. Almighty God, we thank you for these who have come. Lord, we pray for those who could not, whatever the reason may be. But Lord, we do pray that we'll continue to just lift your name up in high because we know that this is the time of the season, that we should remember this is a holy time throughout the entire world. Lord, we know that it's not always holy throughout the world. But Lord, especially this time, even unbelievers know it's time for Easter. And we know that we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we know that that's the foundation of our faith. Today, Lord, I pray that if there's one that doesn't know you, maybe they're watching by internet or Lord, by any other way. I pray, Lord, that they'll come to know you as their Lord and their Savior. Again, we give you thanks. I ask you, Lord, to empty me of me and fill me with thy Holy Spirit, that everything that I do and every word that I preach would be the truth and the love of God. And I pray all this through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Well, it's good to be back in the house of the Lord, as always. And uh, just a couple of announcements, and we're going to go on with our service. Reminding you now, April the 1st, we're going to be having our Monday service. And then on Saturday, we're going to be having our Easter egg hunt and our hot dog supper following that. And then we're going to have Easter sunrise service at 7. Now, it's always a wonderful time. I don't know if you've ever had that opportunity to come, but I would tell you that it just seems like it's one of the most refreshing times to come into the house of God to worship. I pray that you'll make plans for that. And then afterwards, we're going to have breakfast. And then we're going to have a pause. And that pause is right before we have our Sunday school. And then we'll have our normal time, our, our 11 o'clock service. And we pray that you'll invite others, maybe people that doesn't, uh, doesn't go to church, unchurched people, that needs an invitation. 
And that might be all they're waiting on. Who knows? You'll all be responsible for saving a soul. I hope and pray you do. And I pray today that it'll be a time when we just realize that all the things that we're doing and all the things that we're trying to do is to glorify God. Now, I have a, a few prayer requests, and one of them is <clears throat> I ask you to continue to remember Debbie in your prayers. Uh, I tried to call Gene. I didn't get a hold of him, but I would just say that, that you need to continue to lift him in prayer. Continue to remember Kim in your prayers. I know that I talk with her, and she's, she's still... Uh, not 100%. We need to continue to lift her in prayer. I ask you to pray for my wife. I ask you to pray for Miss Mary, who's in a, a nursing home down in Wadesboro. And I ask you to, uh, to pray for Jenny and, and Charlie Patrick. Uh, Charlie came over early this morning to make sure he got his ties in. And I just want to say that uh, we have a lot of folks that are not here, and we don't always know why, but I'd ask you to remember Stella in your prayers and Miss Yvonne Stroop in your prayers. Maybe there's somebody by just happenstance that I've overlooked. But I'd ask you to remember uh, Melinda in your prayers. And we have family members, but we also have one other thing. We have unspoken requests. If you have an unspoken request for prayer this morning, would you raise your hand? We're going to be praying for that particular thing. So I'm going to ask Joe uh, Black if he would get up and pray for our sick folks today. And then we'll continue in our service. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for allowing us to be in your house again today, Lord, to be able to come and worship and praise you. And I pray, Father, that each one that's here today has come with worship in their hearts for you. And Lord, we know that there are many sick, many afflicted, many traveling, many out today for whatever reason, Lord. And Lord, especially be with those that are shut in, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that you would touch each one in a mighty way. Father, we ask that your hand be upon them, Lord. And Father, we pray from our hearts that healing come upon them, Lord. And Lord, we know that healing in our minds aren't always what you see as healing. But Father, we know that you know that what's best and what each one needs, Lord. And Father, we just pray that you would just touch each heart, each body, Lord, each situation. Father, we pray that your hand be upon it. And Lord, we just thank you for your blessings of life today. We thank you, Lord, for your love and your mercy and your grace. Father, we pray that as we go into our worship today, we pray that you would be glorified by it all. And Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would come and commune with us today, Lord. And Father, we give you thanks for all this. And it's through the name of Jesus Christ, our loving Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. 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 Okay. Now, if you get your hymn books and turn to page 76 and stand as we sing our offertory hymn.
Put your name in your prayer. Amen. Amen. think you might need to turn it up. I couldn't hear the music earlier. Morning.
Bibles, find Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. The title of the message today is The Question That Condemned Jesus. You know, uh, it was really strange. I had read an article some time ago, and, and I thought it made all the sense in the world, so I use it as an introduction this morning. A Jewish father was concerned about his son. He had, uh, he was a Judaizer, he was into Judaism, and yet he had failed to raise him and be grounded uh, in that particular faith, Judaism. So hoping to remedy this, he sent his son to Israel, thought it would make up the difference, and he knew that he would be taught Judaism there, so the boy could experience his heritage. A year later, the young man returned home and said, Father, thank you for sending me to the land of our fathers. It was wonderful and enlightening. However, I must confess that while in Israel, I converted to Christianity. Well, the father was real upset, and by Jewish tradition, he called his best friend. And he says, I need you to pray with me. I sent my son to Israel. And I wanted him to learn and be grounded in Judaism. He comes back and says he's a Christian. His friend says, well, I did the same thing. I sent my son there. And he was supposed to be grounded in Judaism. But he comes back a year later and says, Father, I've converted to Christianity. So they both agreed. They found the, what they should do. And that was to seek the rabbi and, and, and talk to him and pray with him. So he went to the rabbi and they both said to him, says, both of our sons we sent to Jerusalem that they would be grounded in Judaism. The rabbi says, I know your problem. I sent my son to be grounded in Judaism and he comes back a Christian. You know, let's three go to the Lord. That's where we'll find our answer. So they all three went to the Lord, and as they were praying and telling them about what had happened, the Lord spoke to them and said, I too sent my son to Jerusalem. Now if you didn't get that, the father was saying, I sent Jesus. That is our Christianity. Christ's likeness for the one who died for us. But well, there was a question that condemned Christ that he knew that if he answered it, he would be condemned because the people had already related to what he had said. And I'll mention that in this message so you'll understand the message that condemned Jesus. The very question. One of the most dramatic events in human history took place when God sent his son to Israel for each and every one of us. We are the byproduct of that trip that Christ ventured into Jerusalem to die for mine and your sins. People who had been lifelong Jews were transformed by His presence, His power, and His words. You know, one of the things Western religious proclaim is <clears throat> we've always done it this way we're just not going to change. Now, let me say this to you before you do such a statement, is we're always subject to change. Day by day by day by day. By the Word of God, by the hand of God, by the ways of God. You will never stay the same. A death in the family may change your way. It could be that you have a new baby and your family can change your way. Never say we've always done it this way and we're just not going to change. That is a terrible statement from the lips of a Christian. Understand this. You should be changing every day, growing closer and closer to the Lord. And for the Cindy saying, the price that he paid for you and me. When the church first began on the day of Pentecost, thousands of Jewish people responded by acting upon their faith. 
Now let me say this to you as I mentioned Wednesday night in our Bible study. When you were born, God put faith in you. It is for you to develop. It is for you to nurture. It is for you to grow in. And I also said, how do I grow in my faith? I grow in my faith by knowing all I can about Jesus. The more I know about Him, the more I believe and my faith continues to strengthen. The more you know about somebody, you'll know what part you're going to allow them to play in your life. And the more you know about Jesus, that is the same thing. What is He going to do in my life? What will I trust Him with? Will I trust Him with my troubles? Will I trust Him with my family? Will I trust Him in the decisions that I need to make that would be for my livelihood? What will I trust Him with? The more you know about Jesus, the more you'll trust Him. That's how you grow in your faith. You see, those at Pentecost, they responded. They repented of their sins and, and were buried in the, in the waters of Christian baptism. In those early days, the Jews... Uh, grew, they grew by leaps and bounds. It seemed that whatever and whoever came in contact with Jesus or with the disciples, they were converted in love because people loved Him. We live in a Christian society that's more interested in the letter of the law than in the spirit of the law. We are based too much on what we are condemned for or what we're doing as versed with our relationship with God. We will judge a person by what they have done instead of their relationship with the Lord. Ted Bundy, a notorious murderer of women, young women. There's no telling. They don't even know how many he had killed. They were about to execute him. And on the day before the execution or around that particular time, someone said that Ted Bundy asked Jesus to forgive him. And he converted to Christianity. Now let me tell you something. We're going to continue as society to condemn him for what he done not for his profession of Jesus Christ. We fail in everything we do in other people. How is it? Well, we condemn them for what they do, and we should love them for who they love. If Jesus Christ is the love of your life, why is it that you care more about what a person has done than their relationship with Jesus Christ. You see, we judge them and they judge Jesus in every step He took. It was one of the things that we should see that we must be more interested in the spirit of the law than the letter of the law, but obey the law. Now we must see here that there is a danger of just wanting the information and knowledge in our Bible and in our services and in our messages. It's one thing to have the knowledge of God, but not know Him. We can tell people about Jesus and yet still not have a personal relationship with Him. We can talk about all that we have learned this week in Bible study or Sunday school or in the message today. And we'll take that and we can tell somebody. We'll take our notes and put everything together. And by the way, it's good to take your notes. If you're taking them to share with someone else. They're not to be like the Bible. Leave church and close it and not open it up again until next Sunday. We must realize that the notes we take and the things that God is allowing us to learn is for us to completely realize that that has to be shared. Somebody said to me, Pastor, how do you know so much? 
Now you're going to think, well, the pastor's bragging. No, God said, if I give to you and you share it, I'll give you more. In other words, you can't outgive God. We ain't talking about money. We're talking about the things that would help us live and to understand that my faith is growing in Christ Jesus every time I know more about it. And the more that I share that with you, the more you share it with somebody else, the more God's going to give to you and the more God's going to give to me. And our church will grow in the Spirit and not the letter of the law. We will start looking at people, not for what they've done, but for their relationship with Jesus Christ and the faithfulness they show Him. You see, so many times we miss all that. So today I want to begin with, you know, and I mean this, not everybody loved Jesus. There were those who didn't like Him. There were those who turned away from Him. <clears throat> and there were those who tried to argue with Him. And every once in a while there were those who reacted violently to Jesus. It was the high priest Annas who plotted to kill him. So now, I want you to see something that John mentioned, and then we'll get to our scripture. There's a time when Jesus declared in John 8, 58, Before Abraham was born, I am. At this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple grounds. They didn't believe they hated him because he confessed that he was the Son of God. Then later Jesus proclaimed in John 10, 30, I and the Father are one. That tells us again the Jews picked up stones to stone him. And down here in Matthew, Caiaphas, the court, he has a symbol erupted in some kind of voice and violence of danger. And we read about these in Matthew chapter 26, verse 62. Well, let's go back over. Let's go to 57 and follow. And they that had laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him afar off into the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Have you ever noticed when somebody hates you, it doesn't make any difference what they got to say about you, but they'll always mix up lies with their truth. They'll always bring up something that you're not guilty of. And they proclaim things against you which is a falsehood. Jesus hates liars. Jesus hates falsehood. You must see here that God is talking about that these witnesses were false witnesses. Verse 60. But found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. Now why? They had all these people where they were willing to lie about Jesus. Why didn't they use all of them? Because they knew that Pilate was very shrewd. And if they came before Pilate and Pilate questioned them, he would expose their falsehood. Did you know that when we go into a court of law and we put our hand on the Bible, so help me God, I will tell the truth. That's what it's meaning, isn't it? Are you willing to tell the truth? Well, do you know what happens when you lay your hand on there and take that oath? You're saying, God, come down and bear witness of my truth. You're actually calling God sometimes to come down to listen to your lie. Now, you're mocking God when you do that. That's the worst. It's a, it's a double, it is a double whammy of a lie. It is going to be judged completely because you swore that you'd tell the truth. And you did not. And I said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said unto him, 
Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against you? In other words, he's saying, do you not hear what these witnesses are saying? Now you say, but preacher, didn't he say that if the temple was uh, destroyed, he could raise it in three days? Well, first of all, let me warn you about something here. The whole truth of that is, is he was talking about his body. He said, this is the temple of God, just like you are the temple of God. He said, it will die, and in three days I'll raise it up, and which he did. We call it the resurrection. We celebrate it in our salvation. But here they thought he was talking about the building. A lot of you will come in here and say, this is church. This is church. Every single one of us, that's church. We're in a building. We gather together in a building. But the church is in here. And so you begin to see what is given here. And he said, answers thou nothing? What is it with these witness against thee? Now again, I want you to listen carefully. When a person misunderstands what you say and tells someone else, they've told a lie. When you misquote somebody and you turn it to be what you consider something, you say, but I'm innocent of that. I, I didn't understand it. Then speak nothing. For God says, I will judge you for every word. So when you think you've misunderstood, first of all, let me say this. You say, well, God surely is not going to condemn me when I'm innocent and I didn't know any better. When he hung on that cross, he made a prayer. And what did he say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And because they knew not what they do, they were going to be judged because they were doing something they didn't understand. And people quote things they didn't understand, and therefore it is no different. You got that? Say amen. Amen. We have to tread lightly and be very careful because we just reckless with what we say. We're reckless and say, well, you can't judge me. You know, I didn't understand it that way, so I'm okay. You might be in your own eyes, but not in the eyes of God. You better get it right. These are important facts that you should know about who you're serving. You know... Here comes Caiaphas and, and his court. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee. In other words, I'm going to challenge you for the truth. I'm putting you under the penalty of an oath. I want you to answer under the penalty of a curse, of an oath. Well, Jesus couldn't tell a lie. I've told you time and time again. Jesus cannot tell a lie. And those that truly belong to Him need to practice the same thing. But here, what does He say to him? He said, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He is guilty of death. Then did they spit in his face and buffeted him. Now what does buffeted mean here? Well, one thing is that a lot of times they say he hit him. But buffeted means they come from here and hit him as hard as they could with force. The, the Bible puts buffeted in here to let you know that he didn't just get a hit like so. He got a full force of the fist. As hard as that person could force to hit him. Friend, let me tell you something. That's hatred. That's violence. Now you listen very carefully. 
this is the first time that religious men become violent. We have that here. And we see here, all because he admits to being the Son of God. What if somebody would hate you enough to kill you because you admit who you are? Jessica, are you a child of God? And she says, I am. Oh, well, let's kill her. And you say, preacher, that's silly. That's coming, my friend. That's coming. Our, our faith has never been tested in this country. Western religion has just been nonchalantly moving along. It may cost you your life. Have you ever sat down to think, what will I give for my relationship with Jesus Christ? What am I willing to pay? Well, I'll tell you what he paid for you and me. He paid with his life. And when Christians in this country are willing to accept that same value in their relationship with Him, this country is going to change. And we're going to win more souls to Jesus Christ. But you see, we're not willing to even be embarrassed. We're not even willing for a door to be slammed in our face. Oh, if you could have been with me many times. <laughs> Jim and Blaine one time said, Preacher, we're so sorry that man slammed that door in your face. I said, I'm not. I'm not. The Bible says, He who is following Christ will be persecuted. But I said, you know, the fact of the matter, before he could shut the door, the Holy Spirit was still all over him. And his conviction... You know, one of the things I'm learning and learn is God abides with you everywhere you go. Everywhere you go. And when you are persecuted, you should rejoice. A person said to me, Pastor, I, I can't be a... I, I can't be the Christian I want to be because I'm tempted all the time. And I said, are you not happy over that? Should I be? I don't like it. I've asked God so many times to take away my temptations because it's constantly, constantly temptation after temptation. I said, why don't you thank God for your temptation? You see, that temptation is a witness of who you belong to. You're not going to be tempted. You see, an unsaved person just does what's natural. The natural sin of man. He just gives in to it. But a child of God will rebel against it. That's why one day you're going to hear Christ say, Enter into my presence. Enter into my rest. And that's what he's telling us. I know you will become weary. But now let me warn you. There is no temptation. Now listen. There is no temptation that's going to come your way that God is not going to be in control of. In other words, Bo, on a scale of 1 to 10, Bo can, Bo can be tempted at a power of 5. Andrew, he might be tempted at a power of 6. Jessica might be tempted at, at an 8. And it goes on and on and God says, this person will be tempted at this particular. And he, God puts the, the, the restraints on Satan. That the temptations that are coming to you is known to men. But God is the one who allows that much and the power of Satan can have upon your temptation. You got that say amen. Because he is God. Why does He allow us to be tempted? That we may grow. You see, if we don't exercise our muscles, they become nothing. If we don't exercise our faith, that's why people say, 
If it's okay, I'd just like to sit back and get a bag of potato chips and watch TV and let God take care of my faith. Well, he's given it to you to take care of. And so that's why the temptations come. We don't always have a great understanding. But what if somebody wanted to kill you because who you claim to be? According to the Old Testament law, the high priest was to serve until he died. But here we have Caiaphas that's appointed by the Romans. And when he was appointed by the Romans, you see, the true high priest was his father-in-law, Annas. And even though Annas was still alive, the Romans said, we're going to appoint Caiaphas. Now, how did he get appointed? Well, he gave him a lot of money. He bought his high priesthood through the Romans. Do you know that tells us a little something? Did you know that's coming here? We're going to have a one world government, a one world religion. And when that happens, there'll be no separation of church and state. They will say, well, down at Ridgeview Baptist Church, so-and-so is going to pastor that church. They're, uh, they're on the paycheck and the, uh, the government has employed them and that's what they are. They're not God called and they will not be preaching this word. You think that's in the future. It is on this road. And it's close. God is making it very plain to you and I that we need to be very careful. You see, Christians today frown on the ungodly policies that our government is making a law to live by. That's why they hate Christians. That's why they're saying, you know, we need to have control over these religious hatred people, these Christians. We need to be in charge because all they're doing is they, every law we pass, they have something to say about it. But if we own and we control the religion, then we'll put our man in there that tells everybody that it's okay to abort child. It's okay to drink and gamble. It's okay for drugs to be legalized. All of these, when our man's in office, he'll say, hey, okay. That's coming. You know, up until to this point of Jesus' trial, there had been really no violence. There had been false witness, illegal trials, and everything else. But these religious people had not been violent. But now they've graduated. Let me tell you something that it tells us. We may not start out being violent about something. We may start out with disagreement. But then Satan takes it and pushes it. And pushes it into the next stage. Now it's no longer disagreement. Now it's resorted to violence. That's what has taken place. You know, I can imagine somebody... Uh, reading and understanding what some of this is. This is the beginning of violence for religious people and violence has crept in our churches today. People who don't follow Christ but other people in the church. Now listen. Church splits come when the members quit following Jesus. They'll either start following the preacher and don't you dare. Or they'll follow a group of people and when they begin to do that, they're no longer following Christ. Violence comes into the church. Church splits. Sometimes it, it's split by word. Now don't get me wrong, it's ugly words. But there have been where they've resulted to fisticuffs. And fighting and threatening. You see, that's what happens when a church stops following the Savior and starts following men. Whether he's the pastor or whether he's a group of people. You have to realize that that's one of the things because God calls them the children of wrath. And the children of wrath have a place of punishment and a place called hell. 
I can imagine someone reading this text for the first time and, and say, what happened? What did Jesus say that was so offensive? Well, I can tell you these men were religious, but they didn't follow God. They followed a group of men. Here's a prime example of what we're warned about. You see these false witnesses and all the people that said crucify Him? They weren't following God. They were following men. They were following that high priest. They were following the religious leaders of the day. Violent men who had murder in their hearts even if they had to tell a lie to get the murder done. What a sad thing. Our churches are guilty of the same thing today. We're following a group of people. We're, we're going down to the altar because my friends went down there. We're doing this or we're doing that, but we're not following Jesus. And it's time to turn our hearts on the road which is narrow that follows and takes us to the Lord Jesus. The second thing I want you to see is the term of God. The Son of God shows up only a few times in the Gospels. Jesus never referred to Himself as the Son of God. He did in this trial. And by the way, He did it to the woman at the well. She said, Messiah comes, and when He comes, He'll tell us all things. And Jesus said, I am He. He tells this woman whose wickedness she'd been married five times and was living with a guy. I'm telling you that I look at the, the mercy of God. When I read something like that, I almost have to cry because I say, God, how wonderfully merciful and loving you are. You see, He always referred to Himself as the Son of Man, never the Son of God. But when others use this term Son of God, it's usually pretty significant. Jesus affirmed that He was the Son of God. He applied Himself in Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. And then again he does it in Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. I saw in the night vision and behold one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. In these two questions Jesus is predicting his resurrection and ascension in these two. Psalm 110 verse 1 and Daniel chapter 7 verse 13. Now the angel announced that when Jesus was born to Mary, what did he say in Luke 1 35? The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Now that's another time that it's mentioned. Usually you hear the Son of Man. But here again we see and when the demons repeated this phrase, they were afraid. They trembled in fear. Mark 3.11 Whenever the evil spirits saw Jesus, they fell down before Him and cried out, You are the Son of God. Have you come to punish us before our time? And even there, God was merciful. Not to the pigs. He sent them into a herd of pigs. The Son of God had the power to do it all. See, a lot of people will say, He wasn't God. He was man. He was all man and all God. The only difference is, He took His godly powers and laid them to the side to become a man filled completely with the Holy Spirit. Not one sin, not one that He may come and die for you and me. The Son of God, the Lamb of God without blemish. If He would have had one inkling of a sin, He could not have paid our sin debt. But He was sinless. 
He was truly the Son of God. That's who he was. You see, the demon that possessed Pilate was afraid. Look in John chapter 19, verse 7 and 8. The Jews answered him. Now they're talking to him. We have a law. By our law, he ought to die because he made himself the Son of God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. Now let me tell you something, folks. That demoniac that had over 2,000 in him, demons, came, knelt down, afraid, begging, please don't send us into the abyss. Have you come to punish us before our time? They know that they're going to be punished. Now, that demoniac might have had 2,000, but here's old Pilate, he's got a demon. And that demon inside of him got really afraid. The Bible makes it very plain here. Verse 8 of chapter 19 of John. Now listen. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And went again in the judgment hall and said to Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. He says, Who are you? Who are you? Tell me who you are! Silence. You see, what Pilate was looking for was an answer that would calm his fear. Do you know how many times that we're afraid, but if we had an answer to something, we wouldn't be afraid? But Jesus allowed Pilate to stay afraid. Sometimes it's good for an unsaved person to be afraid that they will come to a place where they know that things are out of their hands and they need a Savior. That's the purpose of fear in an unsaved person that they will recognize they need a Savior. Why am I afraid? I cannot react because I'm afraid. And the truth of that matter is, when they cannot act or they will not turn themselves to God, the demon inside of them makes them violent. They become angry and they become in all sorts of, of uh, demeanor that is just devastating to the people around them. So he's making this very plain. Third thing is there's something about this phrase Son of God that really shook people up. When Caiaphas hears Jesus accept the claim, he literally shouts blasphemy. It would have been blasphemy if Jesus hadn't been God. But he was. The prophecy of Isaiah proclaimed Jesus would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Matthew chapter 1 verse 23 said before Jesus was born, the angel declared Jesus would be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. John wrote in John 1, 1, and we all know this, and in the beginning was the Word. What is the Word? Well, the Word is Jesus. That's what I'm preaching. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Paul wrote in Colossians 2, 9, for in Him, talking about Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead lead by thee. Let me tell you what. Do you know who was in Jesus? Not only Jesus, the Son of God, but God the Father and God the Holy Ghost. All three were in that presence. A man says, why didn't God go to that cross? He did. He did. Now listen to me very carefully. God the Father is in Him. God the Holy Ghost is in Him. But the moment mine and your sins came upon that cross, God the Father left Him. God the Holy Spirit left Him. And at that moment, what did He say? Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God the Father and God the Holy Ghost will not abide in sin. Understand. That's why. All that time He's there. The blood that was shed at Calvary was God's blood. God the Father. He was the one that sent the Lamb. 
that you and I may live. That's what he was speaking to us. Speaking to us in a great way. You see, the fourth thing is, but it was his rightful title. How, how could he ever, never use it when referring to himself? Well, you can only imagine, as it was when Jesus said, before Abraham was, was I, I am. They tried to stone him. Why would they do that? Because they realized that I am was the answer Jehovah gave Moses when Moses asked God's name. says, who, will they, who do I tell them has sent me? And God says, I am that I am. Not because I am. He said, I am that I am. You tell them, I am has sent you. So when they heard Jesus say, before Abraham, I am. So they picked up stones to kill him. They were ready to kill him. They, they said, this is blasphemy. You see, can you imagine? Some people say, well, why didn't he just tell everybody that he was the Son of God? Well, let's go back to the temple, the temptations that I preached not long ago. And Satan says, if you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Well, you heard what Jesus said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. If you're the Son of God, cast yourself off of this temple. The angels will gather you up unless you get, dash your foot against the stone. Now listen. Satan knew who he was. But Satan was confused. Satan knew he had to tempt this man because they were something familiar. You see, Satan had never seen God as a man. And therefore, he was got to push him and push him and push him. And if he pushed him the right way, that way he would not be the lamb that would save the, the people from their sins. Or if he pushed him the right way, he'd know for sure that this is who he needs to kill. And so there he was. He never would have been able to teach. If Jesus would have come out, now listen to me, if Jesus would have come out to the people of, of Israel, the Jewish people of Jerusalem, and the moment that John baptized him, and he would have got up and said, John, tell them who I am. John would have said, the Son of God. And the people would have left. Or they'd have picked up rocks and started to stone. They did not want to believe. So he called himself the Son of Man. Understand that if he one time would have told them that he was the Son of God, well, my friend, Answer him, he is the Son of God. Send him to Calvary. The very question that condemned him was when he said, I am the Son of God. You have said right. And they hated him for it. Even today when everyone realized that Jesus is declared in Scripture being God, people still respond with violence. A good illustration is, and I read this article and I put it in here, the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky had this commentary in the newsletter. Jesus. It's a little name, a small word. Say this little name in public in a way other than obscenity and stand back and watch the fireworks. Do you know how many people say, oh my God, you just well say GD. You're using God's name in vain. You know how many people say, Jesus, I wish I hadn't done that. You've used His name in vain. But when you use His name, Jesus, you anger people. This little name triggers anger, name call it. You can say, God, and you won't hear a word. You can say our Father in heaven, they won't flinch. You can say great spirit, people not in approval. They can say Allah, 
<laughs> and you be deemed tolerant. But when you say Jesus, and just wait for the sonic boom. Articles will appear in the paper. Reprimands will be posted in, in the newspapers by the, the ACLU, the Anti-Christian League, against Christians. You know, they're holding a tremendous amount of power in our government today. The government administration, no, I'm not preaching politics. This president administration we have right now has been humongously supported by the ACLU. You have a preacher? Those stimulus checks sure are hipping out. Have you ever heard of a man named Nero? Nero, he soaked the, pe the Christians in, uh, in like kerosene and oil and tied them to a stake and at night he'd set them on fire so he could see his garden. Do you know what happened when he first came to office? He gave everybody $1,000. Their stimulus check. So let's don't talk about stimulus check. Nero. Nero. Incest. Defied God. No. Understand that nothing is free. It's going to cost you. It may not cost you right now, but it will cost you. Nothing is free. You see, that's not just theology we're talking about here. You, you can believe that Jesus is God all day long and still not really believe that He's the Son of God. Even the demons believe Jesus is God, but they're not saved. Can you tell me anyone who has died for your sins? Jesus. Anybody else? No. Oprah Winfrey says there's more than one way to heaven. I would ask Oprah. Has anybody else died for your sins that would provide a way for you to go to heaven? See, her money has clouded her mind. Did you know she was baptized in a Baptist church, Southern Baptist church? Did you know that one time she believed it all? Well, you folks is playing the lottery hoping to hit it rich. There's a good example of what richness and power will do to somebody that don't know how to use it. It turns them from their God. Why aren't they saved? Because for the very simple reason, they're not willing to let this Lord rule over them. When Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, and I'm almost done, He told her that He had water that would keep her from ever thirsting again. And let me say this to you. I, was, I would love to do my, I love to do my, my uh, devotions. And, and I was over in Job. You might want to put a little note there if you want to. But Job chapter 15 verse 16 and it stopped me dead in my tracks. Here's what it said. How much more abominable and filthy is man that he drinketh iniquity like water. Do you think you can be sinless? Listen again. I'm talking about a filthy man. How much more abominable and filthy is man which drinketh iniquity like water. Let me change the word iniquity to what iniquity means. He drinks sin like he drinks water. Now what am I talking about? My nature, your nature, your nature, your nature. I've got a thirst in me to sin. Boy, I'm telling you, what am I going to do? Man is born with a sinful nature and a thirst for sin, and Job was no exception, and neither are you and I. But when Jesus spoke to the woman at the well, He knew she had been married five times. He knew she was living with a, with a man. <coughs> he said to her, 
If you knew who you who asked you for a drink of water, he would give you water that you'd never thirst again. She said, Well, give me this water. And Jesus did that. Even though she didn't understand it, he said, Well, I'm not going to give it to you. Do you understand? Listen to me. When I got saved, did I understand everything? Did you know? That's the mercy of God. The mercy of God. The mercy of God says to you and I, I don't care if you don't understand right now. She said, give me this water. He gave it to her. You know how I know? He said, now go tell everybody. Boom, she went to tell everybody. Come see a man that's told me all that I have ever done. Could he be the Messiah? The whole town came. She received the water that would quench the thirst of sin. The preacher, I received that same water and I'm still thirsty for sin. But you've got an alternative. You can either drink the sins of filth from the cisterns of this world or you can say, Jesus, I'm going to drink your water. What is that water? His Word. Do you know what happened? It quenches my sin nature. And my friend, listen to me. You will never be rid of the sin nature until you die. And if you die without Jesus, you will spend an eternity in hell. Even though you're tempted and even though the things come your way, that you wonder what I'm going to do. How am I going to respond to this temptations? Jesus says, Come. I've got a quench for your thirst of sin. Drink from me. Ask me for this water. And I will give it to you. That's what he was saying. Now I'm going to close. What am I saying is this. You can believe He's the Son of God. You can believe He's God in the flesh. You can explain the Trinity in every way that even a child will understand it. You can do all that and still reject Jesus as the Son of God. Jesus is God. But Jesus is the Son of God. That's important in your salvation. Proclaiming He is God. Proclaiming he is the Son of God. Do you know what it tells me when I say Jesus is the Son of God? Jesus is the Son of God is my statement that says, and He died for me at Calvary. He is the Son of God sent by the Father to pay my sin debt. Yes, He's God. But Jesus is the Son of God that my sin debt would be paid in full. A famous artist, Steinberg. He was painting Jesus hanging on the cross. And, and at the same time, he would be painting on that. And he'd be painting on numerous other paintings. And he hired a young, beautiful gypsy girl that he wanted to paint. And she was watching him as he's working on the cross, the painting of the cross. And she said to him, He must have been a wicked man for them to do what they did to him. Steinberg looked at her and says, on the contrary, he was a good man. He was a good man. He says it is said that he died for others. The gypsy girl turned to Steinberg and said, did he die for you? Steinberg was not a Christian. But he said that played over and over and over in his mind. And he gave his life to Jesus. So I'm going to end it with this. And I mean it with all my heart. And I believe it with all my heart. So let me ask you something. So Jesus was condemned for the truth. 
Did Jesus die for you? Did Jesus die for you? You see, I can't answer for you. I can answer for me. But when you turn your heart to say, yes, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for me. Then your name is written in the Lamb's book of life to spend an eternity in heaven. But if you reject this Son of God as the way of your salvation, you will spend an eternity in a place called hell. Choice is yours, not mine. If I could do it for you, I would, but I can't. So I'm going to say something to you today. I'm going to say this. Choose life. Choose Jesus. And Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for the love You've shown us, Lord, when You died for our sins. And Lord, let every opportunity we have that we would share what You have given us that others may know who You are and what You have done. That the Father had sent You that He would be glorified in the Son. And we are grateful to say, Hallelujah, what a Savior. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Take your hymn books and turn to 187.